Thank you for joining me for today's study. In the world that we know as the religious world, there are those who believe in Jesus and there are those who do not believe in Jesus. There are those who claim to follow the Bible and those who do not claim to follow the Bible. There are a lot of different kinds of religions in the world. But of those people who believe in Christ and who believe in the Bible, that world that we call Christendom, in that world it would be an accurate statement to say that most of the religious groups teach baptism and most of the religious groups practice baptism and most of the people who belong to the different denominations and religious groups in Christendom have been baptized. But my friend, in spite of all of that being true, baptism has for years been one of the most controversial topics in all of religion. And it remains a controversial topic. When I was growing up, there were a lot of religious public debates that were conducted. You don't find that very frequently today compared to when I was growing up. But during that time, there were a lot of public religious discussions. And many of those public religious debates were about the matter of baptism. And you would have one man standing up and arguing that baptism is essential to salvation. And another man denying that, saying it's not essential to salvation. Some saying that it was essential to get into some church, but not essential in order to go to heaven. And you have a lot of different views about this matter of baptism. And there are families that have been adversely affected by the disagreements that members of that family have about the matter of baptism. So what is the truth about it? Regardless of what you think, and regardless of what I think, because it really doesn't matter what we personally think, what is the truth about the matter? And regardless of what your parents or my parents thought or believed, what is the truth about the matter? And regardless of what your preacher says, and regardless of what any other preacher says, including myself, what is the truth about the matter? Well, where do we turn for the truth? We turn to the Bible, God's holy word. And so today, in the first of two studies that I want to present to you about this matter of baptism, we are going to specifically answer the question, is baptism essential to salvation? In other words, does a person have to be baptized in order to be saved, or is it possible that one can be saved before he's baptized or without being baptized? And as I've already indicated, I will not give to you my thinking about it. I have no right to impose my personal view or opinion about it upon you. And my opinion is not worth any more than yours or anybody else's. So as I sit here today and talk to you about this matter, I'm going to direct you to what the Bible says about it. Then, in the subsequent study, we'll look up on this matter of baptism in a broader view and ask and answer one simple question. What is it that constitutes biblical baptism? Because as I've already said, most people in religious groups that follow the Bible and believe in Jesus have been baptized. But just because they've been baptized doesn't necessarily mean that they've been baptized in a scriptural manner and therefore, that would mean that they have not been baptized in a manner acceptable unto God. So it would be a, a very crucial question to ask and answer of what constitutes biblical baptism. But today, we focus our attention upon this one question. Is baptism essential to salvation? And for the biblical answer, 
for the answer that is the truth as given by God in his holy word, the Bible. We turn to two passages of scripture. The first one being Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And in this scripture, in this text, we have the words of Jesus Christ as he gave to his apostles what we commonly call the Great Commission. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now those are the words of Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And if your Bible, like mine, has the words of Christ in red, you will notice that other than the first five words of chapter 15, it's all in red letters, which tells us it's all from Jesus himself, the Son of God, the one who died upon the cross for us. Now, what does he teach us in this scripture? The first point that I want to make and the first thing that I want to draw our attention to is this, that Jesus in verse 16 gives to us what we in grammatical terms would call a simple sentence. And the simple sentence, if you were to diagram it grammatically, you would see that the simple sentence is, he shall be saved. That's the declaration that Jesus makes. He shall be saved. Go preach the gospel to every creature, he shall be saved. But what he? Any he? Or all he's to whom you preach the gospel? Is it anybody, or is it everybody to whom they preach the gospel that shall be saved? Or is it a particular he? Is it a he that he specified? And of course, the answer to those questions is, it is a particular he. But what he is that? Well, Jesus in the scripture says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not just any he, and not just all those to whom you preach the gospel, but of those to whom you preach the gospel that believe and are baptized. Those are the ones who shall be saved. So we have to understand that this simple sentence, he shall be saved, is modified by the words that believeth and is baptized. So the he that shall be saved is identified by Jesus Christ as the he that believeth and is baptized. Now again, just going straight to the words of Jesus. I want you to notice a little three-letter word in here that is very important, not just grammatically, but it's important to understanding what Jesus is te telling us or has taught to us in the scripture. And that's the three-letter word and, A-N-D. It's a conjunction. And actually, in grammatical terms, in a technical way, it's a coupling, coordinative conjunction. That is, it is used here grammatically in a sense that ties things together and ties things of equal rank together. He that believeth and is baptized. In other words, what's on the front side of that conjunction is equal in importance to what's on the back side of that conjunction. So the believing and the being baptized are of equal importance or of equal rank. So what Jesus said in the scripture is not he that believeth is saved and then can be baptized if he wants to be because that's not what he said. And he did not say, he that is baptized shall be saved and if he believes that's even better. That's not what he said either. 
He said, he that believeth and is baptized. Two things that are required in that scripture. That's the he that shall be saved. Now, that tells me that a man who does not believe the gospel that is preached to him is not going to be saved. The man who does not believe is not going to be saved. He is not saved until he believes the gospel that is preached to him. But it also tells me, equally in importance and significance, that the man who hears the gospel is not saved until he is baptized. It tells me that the man who does not believe is not going to be saved. The man who is not baptized is not going to be saved. It tells me, restating it or rewording it, that the man who is going to be saved is going to be saved when he believes, and he's going to be saved when he is baptized. Jesus said, go preach the gospel. That would be the message that the apostles would declare. You preach the gospel, he stipulated to every creature. He, the creature to whom you preach that gospel, that creature to whom you preach that gospel, that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now what then is required of one who wants to be saved? Believing and being baptized. Open controls. That's the only answer that you can give to that without changing the words of Christ. There are people today who say, <clears throat> well, I just don't think that you have to be baptized to be saved. I think that if you believe in the Lord and you accept him as your personal savior, then you, you're gonna be saved. And you can go ahead and be baptized because it's a good thing to do. You must be baptized in order to obey God, but you're going to be saved before you are baptized. My friend, to say that, you have to change the words of Christ. Can anything be right that changes the words of Christ? Can any doctrine of any church be right, that sets aside the words of Christ and teaches something different from what Jesus said? Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What if that scripture were to say, he that believeth and is baptized shall receive $50,000. Do you think we would have any trouble understanding that? Do you think there would be anybody that would fail to understand what's essential in order to receive the $50,000? Can you imagine someone saying, well, I believe I'll receive it, but I'm not going to be baptized. I don't have to be baptized. Why, no one would say that. If you were to ask somebody, Okay, he that believeth and is baptized shall receive $50,000. Now tell me what a person has to do in order to receive that $50,000. When it comes to money, we would understand that. Well, equally so, we ought to be able to understand that in order to receive salvation, that is forgiveness of our sins, we have to believe and be baptized. Let me ask you to consider this from another angle. Looking at the scripture that I've already read to you and that you are considering in your mind the words of Jesus where he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Looking at that scripture, regardless of what you've previously thought <clears throat> or regardless of what you've heard someone else say about it, answer this question. Where did Jesus place believe? Did he place it there before salvation or after salvation? Now you know the answer because the scripture specifically says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
you'd say, well, it comes before. Jesus placed it before. Okay, now let me ask you this. Since Jesus placed belief before salvation, can one expect to be saved without believing? You'd say, well, no, there's no way. He's, he must believe in order to be saved because Jesus placed it as a prerequisite to salvation. And, of course, you're answering correctly when you say that. All right, now, let's ask the next step on that. Where did Jesus place baptism? Before salvation or after salvation? Just looking at the Scripture and answering it according to the Bible. And, of course, your answer will have to be, well, he placed it before salvation. Well, then, would we not always likewise have to conclude that one is saved when he's baptized and that he's not saved until he's baptized. Can one be saved then without being baptized? No. No. He cannot be saved without being baptized. He cannot be saved without believing because Jesus placed it before salvation. And likewise, he cannot be saved without being baptized because Jesus placed it before salvation. Jesus himself made baptism a prerequisite to salvation just like he made believing a prerequisite to salvation. And no one should expect to be saved without believing and no one should expect to be saved without being baptized. And it is not, according to the words of Jesus, it is not right to say that one can be saved by just believing in Christ without being baptized. Any more than you could say that one can be saved without believing in Christ. <clears throat> but someone will say, oh, but now, uh, there's something I've always wondered. That scripture says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Why doesn't it say, but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned? If baptism is essential, why wouldn't you say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned? Well, from a purely logical standpoint, it wasn't necessary for Jesus to say that. Because it is one's faith that prompts one to be baptized in obedience to the commandment of Christ. And if he doesn't believe in the Lord, then he's not going to be saved simply because he doesn't believe in the first place. It's like if you were to read the sentence or a statement about someone getting an education in school, say, he that enrolleth and is instructed shall be educated. But he that enrolleth not shall be ignorant. Now, why would it be necessary to say, but he that enrolleth not and is not instructed shall be ignorant? Because if you don't enroll, the instruction is not going to take place anyway. So it is the enrolling with the instruction. And just the enrolling within itself doesn't guarantee you an education. And a lot of us, have, of course, learned that the hard way, didn't we? That you can be enrolled in a school, but if you're not receiving the instruction, you're not going to get the education. <clears throat> or someone could say about a man in his living and ingesting food, he that eateth and digesteth shall live. He that eateth not shall die. It's not necessary to even consider the digesting because until he eats, the digesting is not going to take place anyway. And so likewise, when the Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. Baptism is not even necessary to mention. From a purely logical standpoint, you realize that's the case and that's why Jesus didn't say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned, because if he doesn't believe, he's damned anyway. If he doesn't believe, he's certainly not going to be baptized. What does Jesus here teach? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
The second scripture that I want to call your attention to today is in the book of Acts in the second chapter. And there we have the words of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost preaching along with the other apostles to the people gathered there. And in verse 38, the Bible says that Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now let's look carefully at that and analyze what Peter has said. Peter here declares, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is required in order for a person to receive the remission or the forgiveness of sins according to the words of Peter? And may I remind you that the words of Peter here came by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So in essence, in effect, this is God speaking through Peter. So what has God through Peter declared is essential for the forgiveness of sins. Two things are stipulated. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And once again, I call your attention to that conjunction and tying repentance and baptism together, making them of equal importance or of equal rank. And they are both given as prerequisites to the forgiveness of sins. And I might ask you, as I did with Mark 16, verse 16, a moment ago, where does the Bible place repentance in that scripture? Before the forgiveness of sins or after the forgiveness of sins? Well, of course, the biblical answer is that it is before the forgiveness of sins, which obviously tells us that you don't receive the forgiveness of sins until and unless you repent. But the next question, where does the Bible in that scripture place baptism? Before the forgiveness of sins or after the forgiveness of sins? And again, the only biblical answer, the only correct answer according to the Bible is it is before the forgiveness of sins, which also means that one does not receive the forgiveness of sins until and unless he is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And the purpose of that repentance and the purpose of that baptism is identified in the prepositional phrase. And look at the scripture again now. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That phrase, for the remission of sins, is a prepositional phrase. And here it modifies, grammatically speaking, you remember from school days how we used to diagram sentences? And if you were to diagram this sentence, you would see that it modifies repentance and it modifies baptism. And it is a prepositional phrase that identifies the purpose of the repentance and the purpose of the baptism, which is for the remission of sins. But a man said to me one time, he said, yeah, but uh, my preacher said that uh, that word for there means because, like, I got a ticket for speeding, which means I got a ticket because I was speeding. And here, Peter said, I'm supposed to be baptized because I have the remission of sins. Well, first of all, if that would be the case, then it would mean that you repent from your sins because you have the remission of sins. And that wouldn't make much sense, would it? But in the second place, I recall the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus said, This is my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He used the same words that are found here in Acts 2.38. They're the same, they're identical in the English, and by the way, they are identical in the Greek language from which we get our English translation. And the words are these. Jesus said, I shed my blood for the remission of sins. What did he mean by that? 
Did he mean that he was shedding his blood because we already had the forgiveness of sins? Of course, you know that's not true. He shed his blood in order that we might have the remission of our sins. All right, let's go back to Acts 2, verse 38. Peter used the same words. You repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. What would be the purpose of the repentance then? Because we already have the remission of sins? No, but we repent in order to obtain the remission of sins. Why are we baptized? Because we already have the remission of sins? No, he said you be baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. It translates the Greek word ice, which always has a forward direction pointing toward the reason why it's done. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's really not that hard to understand, is it? It's really not a complicated matter at all. It's just simply a matter of accepting what the Bible says. If Jesus himself were to walk right here to in front of me at this moment, I might look at him and say, Jesus, we were just studying about who shall be saved? Would you tell us who shall be saved? And he might turn and look straight into that camera that I'm looking at right now and just say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It really is that simple. And my friend, it doesn't matter what you think or what I think or what your preacher says, or what I as a preacher would say. You go to the Bible, you study the Bible, you search the scriptures, go through these same texts that we've looked at today, and you let the Bible answer the question, is baptism essential to salvation? According to the Bible, it is essential, which simply means that until you are baptized, in the name of Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, you are not saved. But the good news is that if you'll make that decision to be baptized in the name of Jesus, to have your sins washed away, God will save you. And I hope you'll consider that seriously and do as the Bible teaches. Thank you for joining me. I bid you a Activate pleasant default. good day. Timer, button, flat, select, living room, apple, selected.